Welcome back, everybody, to the second lecture of the Big Data series. So it's nice to see again a full lecture hall. We also have, I think, a bit more people on Zoom than uh, yesterday. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is simply finish what we started yesterday. It's a bit of a special lecture. So what I'm going to do is a brush up of what those of you who have attended a relational database lecture during their bachelor's degree, it will be all familiar to you. There will be nothing really new here. Um, it's an opportunity to you, for you to bring it back, uh, uh, you know, on the top of your mind. And uh, for everybody else, for example, I'm thinking in particular of data science master students who might have uh, mathematics or physics or mechanical engineering uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, it's an opportunity to just make sure that you know on the high level um, what, uh, how, how relational database work and uh, what a table is and how it is queried. So, of course, uh, there is no way I'm going to do 14 weeks of teaching in there. I also do not need to because you don't need to actually have all the knowledge. But it is very important that on the high level, you understand these things, what a relational table is, how you can manipulate a relational table, and the SQL language. So, as a reminder from yesterday, what we define in this course as a relational table uh, is uh, when you have an extension, which is a set of tuples with abstract data types. Computer scientists know that as basically a set of maps. It's not necessarily the way you were told in your bachelor studies uh, as a set of maps, but technically this is what it is, right? So uh, if you are mathematicians, then you need to know what a set is, what a bag is, what a list is, and what a map is. So a set, I think it's pretty clear. A bag is the same thing as a set, but you have, in addition, repetition. You can have multiple times the same elements. And with a list, you have the order on top of that. It's basically a finite sequence of whatever, a list. And a map for mathematicians would be known as a partial function. It means that it's a function uh, that, that might not be defined everywhere. So the domain of definition might not match the entire uh, domain of the function, right? So this is what computer scientists call a map or an associative array. So basically, every tuple here, we call them tuples or records or rows or maps. This is basically a map that match that maps every attribute to a value, right? So here, the first row here is a map that associates last with Einstein, first with Albert, and a country with CH, right? So this is a map. So a relational table is a list of maps, right, from an abstract perspective. Sorry, a set of maps. Why did I actually spontaneously say list of maps? Is that the original relational model says that is a set of maps. The order doesn't matter and you don't have duplicates. But later extensions, and especially all the commercial implementations you have of relational databases, actually provides list of maps or bag of maps semantics. It means that the order of the rows actually matters and you can have duplicates in the rows, right? So you have the set, the bag, and the list semantics for the relational model. All right, um, and so what I told you is that once you define a relational table as originally a set of maps, you have three constraints constraints that you put on that. The first constraint is for it to be a table that they have the same attributes. So it means the domain of definition of each one of the maps, each one of the partial functions is the same, and you can assemble it into a table. The second one um, was that you cannot have a table in a table in a table in a table. You cannot nest structures, it must all be atomic, so all flat. Uh, so this is a counterexample. And the third one was that you can assign domains to the attributes, and then uh, all the values in the same column, the same attribute, must have the same type, right? A string, an integer, a date, and so on. And by the way, these types here must be atomic types because otherwise it wouldn't respect the atomic integrity. So the type here cannot be object or array or table or whatever. It has to be something flat, something atomic. All right. And so if you have these three conditions met on our set of maps, we are within the beautiful world of good old relational databases as they were invented in the 70s, right? And the reason I'm teaching it to you like that, instead of the relational definition, which is more classically find, found in textbooks on databases, is because if I define a table as a set of maps, all I need to do to go to, to, do, to, go to big data is to just relax these three constraints and allow uh, breaking these rules, right? Is the sound okay? Is it too loud or is, the, is it okay with the loudspeakers in the room? It's all good? Okay. So 
so yes, NoSQL, this is what we will explore. But for now, I'm here, and this is where we stopped yesterday. I, I said we can manipulate tables, and this is where we stopped, where this is like a restaurant menu, right? So you have plenty, plenty of things that you can do with your queries. You can do set queries. Why? Because a table is a set of maps, right? So obviously, you can do union, intersection, subtraction on these sets of maps, right? You can filter. I will show you uh, in a while. You can rename the attributes. You can rename the relation. Uh, and you can also join tables, you know, in order to get added value, you can do the Cartesian products uh, of, uh, of, of the sets of maps. So it's a mathematical Cartesian product and joins and so on. But let me show you concrete examples. So this here is a selection. It means that you select a subset of the set of maps. It means you pick some of the rows, but not all of the rows. This is typically based on a predicate that is either true or false on every row. And you only keep the rows for which the predicate is true. In that case, for example, the predicate could have been that B uh, is uh, uh, smaller than or equal to two, and you get what there is on the right. Okay, next, a projection. A projection is pretty much the same, but vertically instead of horizontally. So what you do is you say, I want to keep colon A, and I want to keep colon C, right? So this is what I get, and I just drop colon B. This is a projection on A and C. Right? So basically, what you do mathematically is just that you restrict the domain of definition of the maps. Right? So I'm just speaking to mathematicians uh, here that, uh, that uh, you, you, you are clear that this is very formally defined. Okay. Then you have grouping. Grouping is very powerful. It's a bit more expensive on the system. And actually, when we look into MapReduce, we we'll see that we can do it even on trillions of rows. Um, grouping means that you put together all of the rows that have some value in a column in common. In that case, the column on the left, G, that's the grouping key. So we put together in the same, uh, in the same bag everything that has the same value. So I, I have foo, foo, and foo together, then bar, bar, and bar, and bar, and then foo bar and foo bar. So we have three groups. For each one of these groups, I have what's called the grouping key of the group. And here, in that example, I did the sum, right? So 19 plus 4 plus 46 gives you 69 and so on and so on, right? It doesn't have to be the sum. You can do the average, the mean, the max, the count percentiles, and so on and so on, right? Uh, but this is basically what you get. It's called grouping. This is very, very powerful when you want to aggregate uh, statistics and uh, build histograms and that kind of things. All right. Then what you can do is sort the rows. But then you're going to tell me, wait, 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 wait. The table is a set of maps. There is no order in a set. Yes, you would be right. In fact, in order to be able to sort the tables like that, it only works if you consider a table as a list of maps, meaning that you do uh, allow an order on the rows. So if you define a table as a list of maps rather than as a set of maps, then you can sort and you can decide that you want to sort, for example, by first name, by last name, by city, by country. You can even sort on multiple columns, right, in lexicographic order. OK. Here's the next one. This one is a Cartesian product. So it means that you have two tables, not just one, two tables right here and right there. And we compute the Cartesian product of these two tables. So it's the Cartesian product of the set of two records and the set of three records here. And that gives us two times three, six records. It's just all possible combinations with one record here, one record there, right? So you get six of them. This is a Cartesian product. Now, this is big data. So it might be that each one of the input tables has a billion rows. As we will see, I can let you compute how many rows you will get if you compute the Cartesian product of a table with a billion rows times a table with, again, a billion rows, right? Even I have difficulty computing that, so billion, so trillion, quadrillion, quintillion. So you would basically have a quintillion keys in there. Just have the intuition that this is going to break somehow. So a Cartesian product is usually something you want to avoid. In fact, instead of the Cartesian product, what we typically do is we add some selection in there. And that's what we call a join. So in that case, we will actually only keep the combinations of tuples that have the same value for B. So this tuple right there, right here, is matched with this tuple right there. And this tuple right here is matched with this tuple right there. Then you only get two left. This is called a join. Joins are extremely powerful, again, in databases. They are still very expensive compared to selection and projection. So selection and projection is quite efficient to do. 
uh, we'd see you can do it in linear time in terms of complexity. Joins, well, technically, you could argue, yes, we can do that in linear time too, right? There's a trick with hash maps and so on and so on. But actually, it's not so easy. When you do it on large scales, you still need to shuffle things around, and we will spend a few weeks doing that sort of things. So just intuitively, just remember that a join is expensive. It should feel expensive uh, uh, in your minds, right? And a selection and a projection should feel not that expensive. OK. Um, now, a few words about normal forms. Normal forms um, are best practices um, that allow you to have a well-functioning database system. Uh, if you do not follow these best practices and just go ahead and fill your data into tables, you're going to end up with a lot of uh, issues. So I'm not going to show in detail that, because that's, again, several hours of, of lecture. But the problems that you are going to end up with is that, for example, you start deleting data somewhere, and then you have other data somewhere else that is just not connecting anymore, right? That's a deletion anomaly. You can have updates anomalies where you have duplication of data, and you update here, and it's not updated there. So now you have inconsistent data. You can have insertion anomaly where you insert data at, at one place, but then it has inconsistent data compared to somewhere else, right? So just an intuition of that. This is why normal forms were invented, and normal forms are just additional constraints. In addition to the three constraints I gave to you, it's even more constraints that tell you how you should design uh, your, your, the, the table. So choose the attributes, choose how many tables you want, and how you spread the data. All right. So intuitively, the first normal form, well, I have good news. You already know what that is, because this is actually into atomic integrity. You know, when I told you, you do not accept a table in a table in a table, this is the first normal form, right? So this is forbidden, and this is allowed. That's the first normal form. That's a counterexample. Well, that's, you've already seen that, right? As I said, the first normal form is atomic integrity. This is in first normal form. The second normal form, I'm not, there, there's a formal definition, of course, right? But intuitively, it's about the fact that here you might have a compound key, Right? That says, for example, you have, uh, I don't know, a, a, a country and a zip code that uniquely identifies a city, let's say. But then you might have some of the attributes that only depend, for example, on the country. Like you could have the capital of the country in there, but the capital of the country depends on the country, not on the zip code. This is not good practice. Right? In that case, you would be breaking the second normal form that wouldn't be allowed. So this is not good, this is good. Here's a concrete example where we break it. This is a list of attendance of lectures, right, with a leggy number and, 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 and a person and then the lecture ID. And here we see that some of the columns here only depend on the lecture ID and some others only depend on the leggy, while these two together are normally the primary key of the table. So this is a counterexample. What do you do when that happens? Any computer scientists? How do we fix that? Exactly, you break into two tables like this. This is the good practice. This is in the second normal form. And we, on Zoom too, right? We also have good answers on Zoom. Very good. So you just put everything there that has to do with the students, everything there that has to do with the lecture, that this will be called entities in the entity relationship model. And then this table binds the two together. So you would have to join here and join there in order to get back this, right? OK, so this is the second normal form. The third one, intuitively, the third normal form is the idea that when you have a primary key uh, that, that identifies the other values, you could not have something that is transitive in the sense that you could not have intermediate dependencies. Like if this depends on something that in terms depends, in turn depends on the primary key, you disallow that. So this is a counterexample. So here I had to find something a bit fancy because of course, when you go higher with the normal forms, the counterexamples become uh, every time trickier. Um, but basically, here's the idea is that there's a leggy number uh, identifying students which have a, a city and a state that they live in or a country. Um, and you know that in Switzerland, for, in Switzerland, for example, uh, Pfaffikra, there's Pfaffikra Zuri, Pfaffikra Sheets, right? So there's uh, two of them. So these together identify the zip code. Um, but this actually is not directly dependent on the primary key. This determines that, and this determines that. What do you do? Well, again, you split the tables, right? In that case, just do it that way, that you have the city and the state there, but you outsourced 
the zip code, P PLCL is for post light cell, which is zip code in, in German, right? So um, you just outsource the, 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 the zip code in a different table, and here you are in the third normal form. Okay, so all of that should be familiar to uh, all of you who visited the relational database lecture, and for everybody else, should give you an intuition. Now, here's one reason why you shouldn't be scared. We are, in fact, going to throw away, yes, I said throw away the normal forms. It means that we are going to what, do what is called denormalizing the data. So we go to the second, to the first, and even, oh my, to the zeroth normal form. This is what we are going to do. Um, so of course, now you might be wondering, why did we spend an entire semester teaching you in the bachelors that normal forms are good and so on, and now suddenly in big data, I'm telling you now we throw them away. Well, you can only throw away normal forms if you know what you're doing. You need to understand normal forms in order to decide to throw away normal forms. This is super important. And the reason why we throw away normal forms is in order to scale. This is going to help us scaling and get linear complexity at the cost, of course, of these anomalies, update anomaly, deletion anomaly, insertion anomaly. However, in big data, we are not so much worried about anomalies. Why is that? It's because we are going to do analytics very often in a read-only mode. The data is there. We are not actually trying to modify it or anything. It's just there. So actually, the motivation for normal forms is not really putting constraints on us in the, in the, in the world of analytics, right? So this is the main reason why we throw them away. And we will also see that, in fact, throwing away all the way to normal form zero um, is, in fact, amounting to migrating to uh, uh, JSON data frames and so on and so on. This is in fact equivalent. So this is why we are also going to look into uh, syntax and JSON and XML and data frames and validation and so on, because this is what this is about. It is about denormalizing the data in order to make the computations more efficient. Right? So I spent, of course, several weeks, we are going to do that and go into details, but I just wanted to give you the intuition of the first normal forms. Any questions so far? Not in the room, on Zoom, any questions? Okay. So you understand, you're understanding everything I'm telling you? Right? Okay, awesome. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to languages, query languages. How do we actually write a, a, a program or a query in order to manipulate tables? Well, this is the landscape of, you know, all the categories of languages that there are out there. So I classify them in this way, that we have here the software engineering languages, the good old programming languages, and every time I have two levels. The first level is actually the older one, it's assembly code. It's in the old days of computers where you have to write individual instructions at the level of the, of the CPU and the memory and so on, uh, and you write that. Actually, some people actually did directly write assembly code back then in order to program operating systems and actually bootstrap other languages, right? So this is assembly code. In fact, before that, there was even punch cards. Uh, we even had that at ETH before the Department of Computer Science existed. It was in the Departments of Mathematics and Electrical Engineering. There was a room somewhere where the PhD students could bring their, their punch cards, and then they came back the day one day later, only to discover that there was actually a bug and something didn't work, and then they need to do it again. So you see how blessed we are today with computers and laptops that we can just do things instantly, right? But let's go back to this. So we have assembly code. Um, and then higher level languages that emerged later, there was C, COBOL, Fortran at first, and then object-oriented languages like Java, C++, uh, Python, and so on, right? But these are imperative languages. Why? They have side effects. Every time you do something, it modifies the state in the computer. So this is software engineering. Then we have the database languages. We have the high-level declarative languages that are query languages, and an example of that is SQL or SQL. We we'll see that there's other languages. Actually, it should be specific to the shape of the data that you are using, but SQL for tables. And this would be a bit compared to Java or C++ because it's on a higher level, 
but we see that with a high level query language, we will see we can optimize things better. It's easier to learn, easier to write. You're isolated from the rest of the system. You can reuse the same query, even swapping the back end and so on and so on and so on. And you can optimize and run faster. Um, but there is an equivalent of assembly codes too. And these are the APIs where, where you use in a language like Java or Python, an API to manipulate data frames, for example. This is kind of the equivalent of assembly codes on the database side, right? It's also very useful, this assembly code, because how do you implement these query languages? Where well, you implement them on top of this, right? So this is one layer where you have all the APIs and on top of that, you can implement a higher level query language. And this is what you then type in a fancy Jupyter notebook uh, in order to, this is what you will do next week with the exercise on SQL. And then this is looking to the future. This is machine learning. We have again, the same stack with what I would again compare to uh, uh, assembly code, which is, I call it, here is an example language because that's pretty much what machine learning is, right? I give you a million pictures of cats, a million pictures of dogs, and here are examples of cats and dogs. And now you can tell me if a new picture is a cat or a dog, right? So this is why I kind of call it, here is an example language. So we have a uh, uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so on and so on. So plenty of languages that are still hosted in a, a programming language, right? But we start seeing the emergence of higher level languages to do machine learning in a declarative way. This is called declarative machine learning. It's very, very new. We are at the very beginning of that, but it is very likely that in the future, we'll start doing machine learning on a higher level, similar to how SQL and other languages query data and how Java uh, is in comparison to assembly code. So this is very, very new and uh, I'm looking forward to see how it evolves actually. But in this lecture, this is what we'll focus on, right? So we'll look into high-level query languages and also data frame APIs and so on. So we'll learn all of that. But in this, in, in this brush-up lecture, I'm specifically focusing on SQL, SQL. SQL is a language that was invented actually quite shortly after Edgar Cott came up with the data independence. So uh, this originated at uh, IBM with Don Chamberlain and uh, Raymond Boyce. Um, and it was in uh, California, San Jose. Uh, the, the laboratory, by the way, still exists. It's called Almaden now. Um, and uh, there was a first commercial software very quickly in the, in the 1970s already um, that was based on a language called SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L, for a structured English query language. And the, the, the system was called System R, right? And this was the first customer that was 1977. Right, that's uh, more than 40 years ago. Wow, okay, very long ago. Um, and then of course, the, the early companies uh, developed and grew. And for example, one was called Software Development Laboratories. And now I'm pretty sure you know it's called Oracle. That's one of the giants now of databases. So basically there's Oracle, IBM, Microsoft are the big three of uh, classical relational databases. Okay, so what about SQL? Great. The idea is that you should be able to query a database with something that is very intuitive and that sounds a bit like English in the way you interact in order to manipulate the table. So it should be declarative, not imperative, right? You just declare what you would like to have. The second property that it will have is that it is set-based. What it means is that instead of manipulating single values or single pointers, the language manipulates sets or bags or lists, depending on the semantics. But you basically, in the language, you can hold a value that is actually a table that has a billion rows. And that's just a single value. So that's called the set-based language. So it manipulates entire relations. It's really a table calculator, as I said yesterday. Now, SQL is no longer called SQL in that way because there was a trademark issue with plenty of lawyers at the time. And so they couldn't actually call it that way. So they moved to SQL. And in fact, this is the reason why now today, uh, some people say SQL and some people say SQL, right? So SQL was kept as a habit from these earlier times. Uh, just out of curiosity, who here would say SQL? Okay, who says SQL? A minority, but still some of you. Yeah, I tend to say SQL as well, actually. I, I was probably influenced uh, by, by uh, the generation of people who, uh, uh, who, who were at that time contributed to SQL. All right, um, so what's important about SQL is that it's a declarative, 
language, meaning that it works on the logical model, that's the relational model, the tables as sets of maps. And we have a physical execution, of course, but that physical execution, we don't really care what that is. Could be a single machine, we'd see later can be a cluster of machines. And there are several implementations. There's the uh, IBMs, Oracle's, Microsoft's, uh, PostgreSQL, there's plenty of implementations uh, that implement the same model. So SQL is a declarative language. We can parallelize, we will parallelize during this semester actually heavily. Uh, it is also a functional language. So what's the difference between a declarative and a functional language? Well, very often it's kind of put in the same box, right? If you're declarative, you're also functional and so on. But it doesn't really have to be, in fact. So a functional language, I think of a legal game, right? It basically means that just like you would manipulate mathematical formulas, like with addition, multiplication, arithmetic, and so on, it's just a generalization of that to uh, tables. So this is why it's a functional language. So a functional language in its model is based on the fact that you, uh, that you have the evaluation of uh, functions that take some input in the model and have some output in the model. For example, take a table as input, a table as, as output. And then what you get is an execution tree, it's called the query plan, where you can take tables and the, date, the tables flow in the query plan all the way to the, to the uh, output of the program that gives you a table. So it's just a, a chain of mathematical function calls. That's basically what it is. Like for example, f of g of x comma h of x. That would be an example of a functional language. But of course, in a functional language, you don't actually write the functions directly. You actually have some fancy looking syntax that hides that you're actually uh, calling functions, right? And I will show you SQL uh, how, how it looks like. But basically, this is why it's called the functional language, because it's based on mathematical functions that you just chain with each other in order to get some execution. But again, if, you, if this is confusing what I'm saying, think of a Lego game. You're just assembling Lego and, and making it bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, here's SQL. So in that case, this is an example of selection. Selection, remember, it means that we keep some of the rows, but not all of them. How do we do a selection? You see, it looks like English. We select everything from persons. What is person is the name of that table. Select everything from persons where the last name is crusher. So last name is right here, so, so you see. Last name must be crusher, that's called a predicate. So we will only keep here that second record. So the output of this SQL query is this table right there, okay? So a SQL query takes a table as input, that's with the from clause, and it outputs another table, right? So you see why it's functional. Takes a table, outputs a table. Okay, is this clear for everybody? It's a pretty intuitive language, right? That, that's designed to sound like English. And even though it's functional, there is no parenthesis here. In a function call, you would have a parenthesis, right? But there are no parentheses anywhere because it's just nicely designed to have a readable syntax. Okay, projection, how is it done? Well, instead of the star here, you say select first name and birth date from persons. And this is going to pick that attribute right here and this attribute right there. So you keep these two columns. So this is a projecting query, right? And this is still SQL. Uh, you can rename columns. How do you do it? You, you use as, again, it's English, right? Select first name as who and birth date as when from persons. And then you get who here and when here. And that's it, that's your output. That's a renaming query. Then you have sorting queries. And again, it's just plain English, select everything from persons, order by birth date. It's going to be ascending by default. So it means that this is reordering these values here, it's reordering the records in such a way that the birth dates are ascending. Of course, as I said, if you are ordering and sorting the records, it means we do not have the set of maps semantics, we have the list of maps semantics. It means that tables is a list of records, not just a set, okay? So this is a sorting query, order by, group by. So I told you how group by is working. So here we say select, I'll come back to that later, select from persons group by century. It means that we are, we are grouping data based on that. So we have a group with 23 
in a group with 24, right? So I have 23, 24. So I'm selecting century here. And here, my aggregation function is the count. So I'm just counting everything, and that's a count column. So here I have two, and here I have two, right? Because I had two records with 23, two records with 24. So this is a grouping query. You can also further filter after the group by. So if you want to not keep all of the groups, but only the groups that have, for example, at least three, so strictly more than two, then you just add a having clause. Um, so all of these queries that I've shown you, they pretty much look alike, right? It's select from where. And you might have some additional things to select from where. You might have select from where order by, select from where group by, having, and so on and so on. In fact, that's pretty much the structure. You can combine them together with all the clauses and then the order, I'm going to try to, to give you the order, it's select from where, group by, having, order by, and then you even have limit offsets that just in order to paginate the results. So select from where, group by, having, order by, limit offset. That would be a full-blown query that uses all of the clauses, but of course, many are optional. Okay, who is following? All right. So of course you'll have plenty of exercises next week in order to make sure that you that you uh, that you uh, are uh, comfortable with that. And really, what's really really nice is that this is all interactive. You can type the SQL queries in the Jupyter notebook, and you see the results instantly. So you can really play and you know try to change things and see what happens. And for everybody, most of you actually, it's just going to be a brush. Okay, here's another example of what you can do. You can do a union of two tables. So select star from spaceships one is just the identity function, just takes table one. Select star from spaceship two is the identity function that just outputs table two. And then with the union right here, union, you're just taking the union of this and this, and that gives you this. Right. Let, can I remove the, let me see. Not sure if that should go away the, uh, the, the, in the lecture hall, the control bar here, it seems to be staying. But basically, uh, this is the union of this and that, right? Uh, I think by default, it will eliminate duplicates. So actually, if you do it in PostgreSQL, which we will use, if there is the same records here and here, it will only put it once in the output. So it's going to eliminate duplicates, so it kind of feels like a set semantics. All right. You can do also the intersection, meaning that you only keep the records that are in both tables, this one, or you can do a subtraction, meaning that you take the records here that are not in there. That's called the set subtraction, all right? So union, intersect, except. So you see how this is, this is really a high level language because you can really take a big table, a big table and just merge them together in that way. Sorry, yes. A question on Mundo. Will union work when spaceships one have different columns than spaceships two? That's a very good point. In theory, no, because you should union tables that have the same uh, the same sets of attributes, right? If you if you have these constraints that I told you about. In practice, I suspect that many systems will probably not complain. They will silently try to union them and maybe add some dummy data or uh, plenty of nulls in, in a column. So I suspect it might still work, but be careful, just because it works doesn't mean it's a good idea, right? So you should really think of what you are doing. Normally, you should make sure that if you do the union uh, or intersection or subtraction, they should have the same attributes, all right? There's actually, actually plenty of cases where a, a system will not complain and just silently try to do something, even though you probably did not intend uh, uh, what you are doing. So yeah, this is actually why it's useful to learn the theory of databases, right? Because then you understand what you're doing with the system. All right, did it answer the question? I guess so. Yeah. All right, yes, perfect. All right, so here is the next example of query. It's a join. This is when you take two tables, here and here, these are persons and these are spaceships, and we try to match the persons with the captains of the spaceship. So we match these values with these values. How do we do it? Select star from persons, left outer join, I'll explain why left, spaceships. So we join these two, 
And here's the criterion. The last name of the person must be the captain name of the spaceship. It reads like English, right? Why left? Because I might have here persons that are not the captain of any spaceship. I will still include them in the output, but with nulls everywhere here. So this is just empty. You can do it on the right as well. In that case, you would keep the spaceship where we don't have the captain on the left, and then you have nulls there. And of course, you can have the full outer join where you keep the persons without spaceships and the spaceships without persons. Right? So that's a full outer join. All right. Question yeah. about um, the um, previous the union. So how does it check for the same columns given we can rename them as well for some queries? So for the union, right? If I come back here. Yeah. So um, maybe the question is what about mismatching column names, right? Okay. So um, here it's, it's going to be a bit tricky. I'm, sure I'm going to try not to scare you. In the theory, columns are not ordered, right? There's no order, it's just maps, right? So what you need is just to make sure that the names of the columns are the same on both sides. In the theory, it doesn't matter if the order is different because the order doesn't matter. Now, in implementations, and this is actually when you come to the real world and the actual implementations, you might have some implementations of some databases that do actually care a bit about the order of the columns. So here you just need to check the documentation uh, for that and they will tell you if you need to also pay attention to ordering the columns right. This is really the theory versus practice, right? Did, did it answer the question? Yeah. Yes, awesome. Thank you. Don't hesitate to ask questions, right? This is what I'm here for. All right. So this is the this is the outer join when we specify the predicate. But here's the easier one. It's actually much sorry, uh, much easier to do. Um, the natural join is just the same, but now the column names are the same. Here, look. Last name here, and also last name here. So when you have exactly the same column, you do not need to specify the predicate here because it's implicit that you want to match the columns that have the same names. So if you know that the columns with the same names are exactly the columns you want to join on, then this is easier. You just say persons uh, join spaceships. By the way, here, these are all optional. Actually, if you remove that, that would still, uh, that's to, that would still work. I'm just showing to you the full, uh, the full syntax, right? So you join persons with spaceships, it's automatically matching last name here with last names there. And because you said full outer, it's also keeping the persons without spaceships and the spaceships without persons feeding with nuts. Okay, so that's a natural join. So you've pretty much seen much of the syntax. And once you understand it's a Lego game, what that means is that again, it's like the Inception movie, you can take a select from where query and put it inside the select from where query that is again inside the select from where query and so on and so on. You can actually nest just like you would nest, let's say, addition, right? One plus two plus three. You're nesting an addition in an addition. So you can do the same thing with SQL, and that means that you can have arbitrarily large queries like that. Okay. What's happening in the background is that we have this fancy, it's called an algebra with Greek letters that even can model mathematically what's going on, right? But again, for you, the focus is on SQL. Just make sure to learn SQL. This is what you will need for this semester. A few additional pieces of information is that we have three valued logic, meaning you have true, false, but you can also have unknown. I'm not saying much more about that, but just three valued logics. Something also important is to understand that in a database, you have the data and the schema. So the schema would be the name of the attributes and the domains. The data would be the actual set of maps in the table. So you have schema versus data. And when we manipulate data, it's called DML, data manipulation language. When it's the schema, it's data definition language. All right. Another thing, again, that I'm not going into details of, because we'll study that as well, is you can make queries faster by adding additional data structure that create an index on the table. That's the benefit of SQL. You can accelerate SQL and make it faster without touching your SQL query. Just implementation can make it faster with, uh, with these tricks. Another piece of, uh, of uh, trivia facts is 
we distinguish between write intensive queries. This is typically what is focused on in the in, on the bachelor's level with uh, relational databases versus read intensive queries. And in this course, we'll have a lot of read intensive queries. When we have MapReduce, Spark, and so on, this is read intensive. This is why we are denormalizing the data because we don't care about anomalies. All right. Now a few words also very quickly. This is really meant as a brush up for computer scientists. And if you're not a computer scientist, do not be scared by that because again, it will not prevent you from following the lecture, right? So I'm just making sure to bring that back to your mind. You know ACID, who knows ACID, right? Most of you, ACID, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. This is just to make sure that if you have a thousand people withdrawing money from an ATM at the same time, that this is done correctly. That's pretty much what it is concurrently that the database is going to work. This is why it's better to use a database than just write Python, because in a database, you will get that. So atomicity means either the, the transaction is applied or it's not. It means that either you get your banknotes and it's withdrawn from your account, or you don't get any banknotes and it's not withdrawn from your account. That's atomicity, either or, all or nothing. Consistency means that everybody agrees on what there is on your bank account. It's consistent. No matter where you ask, the result is the same. That's called consistency. And for the specific case of a relational database, uh, it's usually meant in the sense also that there's constraints on the data that you ensure at all times. For example, your amount must be positive on your account. Um, Isolation means that it feels like nobody else is writing to the database. So if you go to the ATM and withdraw your money, you probably don't have in mind that there's probably a thousand other people in Switzerland also withdrawing their money, right? It feels like you're the only one. That's isolation. And finally, durability is that whatever you modify in the database stays there. It's not going to go away when you, you, you disconnect the computer from the network or you know electricity goes down. So this is durability. You store information in a way that it stays there and you can retrieve it again. Okay, so I'm done scaring you for the non-computer scientists or boring you for the computer scientists who already knew everything that I told you today. So what's next? We are going to scale up now. So all of that, the good old data, databases from the 70s, we're gonna look at data with lots of rows billions, trillions of rows. You cannot do that with PostgreSQL or a traditional relational database. So billions or trillions of rows. We are going to look at lots of columns. A relational database breaks above like 250 columns, then it breaks. We are going to look at potentially thousands or millions of columns. It's going to be sparse, but we are going to scale up the columns. And finally, we are doing, going to do something that would make plenty of people scream uh, with normal forms and so on and so on, but we are going to denormalize data and nest data. So lots of nesting as well. And this in fact gives us the plan for the rest of the lecture. So every week we're just gonna look at lots of rows, lots of columns, lots of nesting. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? Who feels that they're on top of things? Like they followed what I told you today. Okay, most of you, perfect. Who is lost? It's fine to be lost, right? I know that not everybody is a computer scientist. So if you are, even if you are shy, you have the exercises next week, your main focus should be solve the exercises and train your SQL skills. Try to write SQL queries in the notebooks, write us emails, write to the TAs, uh, and uh, make sure that we help you. Uh, there is a question, we can throw the microphone maybe. Oh, <laughs> hello. Um, is there an exercise session today? No. no, so there is no exercise session this week. This week, you're just asked to try the Docker installation. You will get instructions. There will be a support session, probably online or something, but there is no exercises. The exercises start next week, and the exercises will be SQL. It's going to be querying a database with SQL to put it into practice, right? Yes, maybe you can throw again. There you go. Right. Um, I have a question where, for example, one may do um, a subquery that would be equivalent to a join statement. Um, in terms of performance, which one would be, would be better? So there is an ideal answer and there is a practical answer. Ideally, it shouldn't matter. 
ideally, as long as two queries are equivalent, it's not your job to make it fast. It's the job of whoever implements the system that you, that you bought. Now, in practice, optimizing everything perfectly is basically uh, um, impossible. It's undecidable. Let, let's call it that way. So this is why, in practice, it might not always actually be optimal, and you might need to know a little bit what works and what doesn't in the system. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Shall we call it a day? All right. So thank you, everybody, for attending. So again, no exercise session. And I'll see you next week at uh, 2 in CAB again next Tuesday. Bye-bye, everybody. I, I will talk with you at the end. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.